Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you enjoyed your afternoon tea on Australia Day. Everyone's out the beach swanning around there. Simon Holman is going to be giving us a talk on the uh, network's bandwidth isolation. Um, for those of you who've got questions, if you could raise your hand before you ask your question so that you can get this microphone, it will be handed to you by one of our, our, our floor walkers. Uh, that will allow AV to pick up your, your voice so it doesn't look funny on the film. Over to you, Simon. Oh, hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, sparing your time for me today. I'm going to be talking about network bandwidth isolation, which basically means doing QoS on in uh, virtual hosts. Um, as it says, my name is Simon Horman. I work for my own company in Tokyo, um, although I am actually from Sydney. Um, so just a quick overview of what we'll be talking about today. I'm going to talk a little bit about the scope of this talk. And then I'm going to talk about how we can identify packets that are coming from guests. I'm going to talk, going to talk about how we can schedule them. And then I'm going to talk about some rather interesting problems that I came up against when deploying this on uh, Red Hat 5, which I uh, believe people still use. Um, so what's the aim of this? What, what, why do I care? What are I worried about? We want to uh, basically ensure that all of the guests ensure, uh, receive a fair share of bandwidth. And importantly, we want this to what the definition of fair share, we want that to be configurable by the administrator. Specifically, it's quite common to have different levels of service, you know, the silver, gold, bronze kind of system. Um, and of course, if you're a gold customer, you would like to get what you paid for. Um, specifically, we're looking in an environment where the different guests have been essentially sold to different customers. Um, it's not necessarily, they're not necessarily cooperative, and even if they are, they may not have uh, upgraded their machines correctly, and they may have some malicious software running there. Um, so essentially, we're talking about a stream of UDP packets, which is going to cause a DOS on the machine, and we'd like to mitigate that somehow. Um, this work was all done with Zen. I'm actually doing quite a lot of work with KVM at the moment. Um, so. I do understand the KVM side of things much better than I used to, but the assumptions that are made in this talk are Zen. If you try and take this and use it on KVM, it, I can tell you with certainty that it will not work as you expect. Um, we're talking about bridge networking. We're not routing the packets from the guests or anything like this. Um, everything is running Linux. Um, and I'm only talking about the transmit path. Um, we, doing QoS on... Um, Ingress traffic is, is quite a different topic, and I, I don't even attempt to tackle that. So what are the resources that we need to worry about? Um, well, what are the resources that I considered when I was worrying about this? There are three. There's the bandwidth of the NIC itself, which is, I guess, the obvious one. Um, less obvious but more important is the CPU on the guest, on the host, uh, where DOM0 is what uh, Zen people call the host, and also the slightly, it tended to be less of a problem, but the memory of DOM0. So the, the guest is running on the machine, and it basically has limitations placed on it. Um, but when it sends packets, they have to be uh, processed by the host, and that naturally consumes some resources on the host. And if it's able to consume a lot of resources on the host, then that may cause the host not to be able to service requests for other guests in the manner you might like. So briefly, uh, I'm just going to introduce the concept of packet scheduling. Um, it is what it sounds like. You prioritize packets um, based on the domain. And this allows us to um, basically, very obviously, maps directly to the bandwidth usage um, and also the CPU package. Usage because CPU usage is directly proportional uh, to the number of packets that are being processed by s per second. Um, so those kind of get grouped together. Um, the memory usage actually relates to the number of packets that are enqueued in the system in any given time, um, which kind of relates to how fast they're going in versus how fast they're going out. Um, but typically, the queue lengths are fixed, so this memory is, is essentially managed. Um, so I want to talk real quickly about um, 
how flow control works in Zen, and um, this is not how it works in KVM. Um, so what have we got? We've got our guest over here, and this net front is basically the guest driver. This is how it's sending packets. Um, and over here we have the host, DOM0, and in between that we have this magic rim buffer thing. So basically what happens here, we have just one packet. Um, and it's got a bit of a header there, which is labeled packet for some reason. Um, but it's got a fragment, just one fragment. It could be more, but usually just one, and some metadata. Um, and this essentially is going to consume two slots. It's pretty straightforward so far. Um, the metadata gets uh, processed straight away and goes straight back on the free list. So that slot can be reused. So uh, if, if this thing was completely full, we now have one free slot, which is not enough to send a new packet, but uh, half enough. Um, the fragment itself, that, uh, that doesn't get uh, freed straight away. That basically goes all the way through the network stack until eventually it gets transmitted on the, uh, the physical NIC driver. And then finally, once that's happened, whoo, goes back on the free list. And uh, well, if nothing else has happened, now we have two slots free over here. We can send another packet. Obviously, there are more than two slots on the ring buffer. I think the default's about 256. Um, but fundamentally, the idea is that um, if packets are coming in here much faster than they're going out here, uh, this will have to slow down. Um, it can spin the CPU doing other things, but that's okay because it's its own CPU. It can't send oodles and oodles of rubbish here, which then has to be processed by over here. It, it will be slowed down, and this is fundamental. This is uh, flow control or back pressure. Um, without this, none of what the rest of what I would speak of today would work at all. Okay, so. That's, that's the background, that's the, sort of the foundations of, of where I'm coming from and the terminology of how to describe what I want to do. If we're going to do flow control on, on packets coming from guests, we need to be able to identify them somehow, um, to be able to say this packet came from guest zero, this packet came from guest one. Um, so this is what a bridge network looks like in my brain. Um, I guess you can draw this diagram differently, but essentially you have you have several guests, and the several guests are connected to a host. Um, the host uh, um, you have uh, <coughs> basically virtual network here, virtual NIC here, which is the other half of it's here, um, and you have several of them, and then they all get bridged here, and then they're sharing a single output interface. I'm primarily focused on packets that are coming out here. Of course, they could also do this kind of thing. Uh, that's fine. That also fits in this model. I'm just not going to put that in my examples. So how do we identify packets? Um, there are several ways, two, two of which, which are interesting are IP tables. Uh, IP tables can basically look at packets that are going through any interface, and it can place a mark on them. Uh, another technology which is a bit newer, and uh, I don't think it's actually particularly useful for Zen, but um, is the NetCLS, and basically this is a, a C group for networking, so we can place tasks inside the C group, and then essentially any packet that or originates for a task in a given C group will be stamped with the mark that's also associated with that C group. Um, I'm not sure. I, I actually added that quite recently to this slide. Which, um, that would work quite well in KVM because essentially you can quite readily associate a, ver a, ver a host with processes. In, K in Zen, it's not clear to me that that's possible, although I haven't specifically investigated that. In any case, I will be using IP tables uh, for my examples today. So this is the same diagram again with some arrows drawn out. So we're looking at packets coming out here. So basically, what we can do is we look at this interface, or this one and this one. We work out which interface the packet's coming from, and we stamp a mark on it accordingly. This is how we identify the packets. Um, so these are some very simple IP tables rules which achieve that. Um, basically, what we do is, for each of the three virtual interfaces, uh, 2.0, 3.0, 5.0, 
we uh, give each of them an individual mark, 100, 110, 120. It's not important what that number is, it's just important that it's unique between the three, or not. If you wanted to group them, you could give the uh, two interfaces the same mark. Um, and it's also, of course, important that when we use those numbers a bit later, we consistently use the same numbers in the same way. Okay, so that's how we identify packets. Um, it's not particularly a challenging part. Um, we're now going to look at how we can schedule them, so how we can slow them down, speed, well, not speed them up, slow them down or not slow them down. So there are a couple of different <clears throat> things we do when we're doing packet sch scheduling. Firstly, we have to filter the packets, um, which essentially is the identifying part. Um, we just have to hook into that mark that we've already set. Then we can prioritize the packets. Uh, we might choose to delay some packets. Um, and we queue them up, and event, or we can drop them. Uh, this is basically the kind of things we're doing when we're packet scheduling. So just going back to the memory briefly, um, the amount of memory that uh, a given guest is consuming um, for its packets in the DOM 0 kernel is limited. It relates directly to the number of ring buffer slots. Um, we basically can't have more packets in queued than there are ring buffer, buffer slots, and each packet has a finite size. Um, so that's kind of nice. In terms of the speed of the packets going through the system, which relates to the CPU usage and the, and the NIC usage, uh, bandwidth usage, um, delaying packets should be sufficient for our needs. If we're getting too many packets from the guest, too many packets per second, it seems logical to just reduce the number that we're actually processing per second. And because of the flow, sem flow control semantics that I described a little earlier, that will slow the guest down. Dropping the packets, it's, you might, I, I kind of initially thought that maybe dropping the packets might be a good idea. It's actually not a very good idea at all because, of course, as soon as you drop the packet, as soon as the host drops a packet, the ring buffer slot is freed, the guest can send another one. And you tend to get into a very, very fast loop of packets coming in and being dropped, and then the CPU usage uh, typically goes to around 100%. Um, and this is precisely what we're trying to avoid. Okay, so <clears throat> one <clears throat> this borrowing is, is a slightly different topic, but um, the idea of borrowing is essentially is let's say that you have two classes set up or two guests set up, and they are each allowed two hundred megabytes a second. Okay, but you know you've got a gigabyte NIC, and you know that absolutely nothing is happening on the system, and you think maybe, okay, that's fine. You can use the entire NIC if it's free. And basically that's the concept of borrowing is to allow, so you have a rate which is, is like a guaranteed amount of bandwidth and then you have this ceiling which is you might get that as long as nothing else is going on. Um, it depends on your view of bandwidth, of whether or not you, how you want to limit it, but essentially if your bandwidth is free, maybe it's all in the same data center, um, this, this notion makes quite a lot of sense. So here is the class hierarchy that I'm going to try and set up for my three guests, and I'm going to have borrowing. So I have <coughs> each of these guests, each of these circles here represents a guest, so there's one for each of the three guests, and there's a third one which is the default, which essentially means traffic coming from the host itself. Um, we have a parent, and this basically sets the global limits, and this t ties into the, um, the borrowing idea. So essentially we have a global limit of 900 megabits a second, and so if only one guest is doing anything, that's the limit that's going to apply, because I've set the ceiling also to be 900 in each class. But if there is some contention on the network, then essentially these li limits will come into play. So I've given one, one guest 500 megabits a second and the rest of them 100 each. Um, these numbers are fairly arbitrary. Um, I don't think they all add up to 900, but uh, I think you get the idea. 
So how do we configure this? What, 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 what command do we run? It's the TC command, the traffic control command, and this is used to configure traffic control. It's used to configure the filters, it's used to configure the classification, and it's used to configure the queue disks. Okay, so firstly we do the root class, which was the one right at the top of that diagram with the green circles. Um, there it is, it's an HTB class. Um, HTB is just the, the name of the specific algorithm I've chosen to use. Um, and then we also do the inner class, which is the one just below it, which essentially is a pool of, of bandwidth for the borrowing. Um, and here we've got the rates 900 and the ceilings 900. Um, this is actually redundant because the ceiling will default to be the rate. Um, I just put it in there to be uh, quite explicit about what's going on. And now we add the leaf classes. Um, again, these numbers correspond to the diagram. So the first one has 900 megabits a second and, and the following three have 100 each. Um, all of the classes have a ceiling of 900 megabits a second. Um, and these, the, <coughs> the parent, <coughs> so these numbers here, the parent number is, is uh, the parent of the class on the previous slide. Again, it's just a number that, um, and here we name each class. We give it a, a, uh, its, own na its own name so we can refer to it a little bit later. And then finally, we put a queue on the end. Actually, this is also not necessary. We put there by default. But again, it's good to define these things um, explicitly, I think. Um, so we have one QDisk for each of the classes on the previous slide. These numbers here uh, co correspond to the handle names we gave in the previous slide. These numbers are fairly arbitrary because these, these QDisks don't have any children. And we're giving a, a limit of 1,000 packets per queue. This, again, is pretty arbitrary. In practice, I found that anything above about 16 was enough. Anything below that, uh, well, I'll, I'll discuss that a little bit more when I get to the, the problems I found. Okay, so the last thing that we're going to do with TC is the filter. So this is basically when the packets are coming through, we have to assign them to the class. And the way these filters work is we're actually hooking into the firewall mark, which was set using IP tables a little earlier, and that's these numbers here, 100, 110, 120. You'll note that the default flow is actually being filtered because it will go there by default. Um, these handle numbers are fairly arbitrary. I just chose to use the same numbers again. So now, essentially, we've, we've set up all of the rules um, as per the, the diagram with the, the green circles. OK. So maybe I should stop now and ask if there's any questions. Um, I'm not going to demo this. You just I, I tested it extensively. There's not a lot to see. You push packets through and you see if they go through at the, the right rate. As with the previous session, if you could put your hand up when you've got a question, we'll make sure a microphone comes to you. I think there's a question at the back. Uh, Simon, um, you were talking about the uh, the ring buffer that's used to talk yes. from the user domain into the DOM zero. So, if the default buffer is 256 uh, fragments, uh, um, because you're using the um, when you're using the TC filters, aren't you risking adding a lot of latency, uh, and hence you've got uh, packets queue, uh, queued up uh, before they're being transmitted. I, I guess I'm thinking around the <coughs> Getty's buffer bloat, whether, where you know, or, or, or you know, so that the, sort the, of idea. Right, that, that's a, a good question. Um, so the question, um, I, I've recently started doing work on latency. Um, this is obviously much more directed towards throughput. Um, I don't think that actually 256 creates a big problem because um, the last time I checked, the way that the 
when the kernel networking core wants to send packets, it basically sends them in, in grabs a bunch of, I think it was 100 packets from interface and sends them and then sends another 100 from the next interface and goes around in a loop like that. And t 256 is more or less in keeping with that because it's only actually 200 and, well, it's only slightly over 100 packets. Um, so I wouldn't expect um, packets to be queued up extensively in the ring buffer. Uh, but you are right. I mean, I'm adding more and more queues. Um, and uh, yes, I, I think that does have latency implications, and I haven't really assessed that. You mentioned early on that um, there's some implementation differences in terms of how uh, the bridging works between Zen and KVM. Have you done something similar with KVM in terms uh, of uh, producing this behavior? Right. So I have, I have done some work on KVM quite recently. Um, so this mechanism I described with the flow control, that's, this is the nub of the difference. Um, I've described how the Zen side works. The KVM side, I'm, I'm a little less familiar with it, but essentially what you have is um, the packets end up in the QMU process, and then they get pushed into the kernel through a socket. So you have a socket buffer, which is essentially your feedback mechanism for this kind of back pressure. Um, unfortunately, there appear to be some bugs in that, and uh, there is a school of thought that the socket buffer size should be reduced to zero. Um, which would mean there would be no back pressure and there would be no chance that this works at all. Ignoring that, um, the current situation is unless you have a corner case in your configuration um, which causes your SKBs to be cloned as they go through the kernel, you will get back pressure and it will work, um, more or less as I've described here. Um, you probably want to use net classes rather than IP tables. Um, that's just details. So have you been doing it with um, Enterprise 5.5 or have you been using... So this uh, work all? here was done on 5.5. My KVM work has just been using kernel.org kernels. Um, to 637 is what was current uh, before I came on this trip. <laughs> okay. Just um, there's been, especially with uh, Red Hat Enterprise 6 mm -hmm. and, and the adoption of C groups as part of the supported base, there's a whole load of work in that network stack. Right. Now, that is one area myself I haven't had a chance to play with yet. It's a little bit more complicated than a few of the other um, C group modules that you can use. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how much work you can do in terms of uh, ingress and egress packet control, but that's one of its aims. Right, so I, 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 I <coughs> let me think. Ingress on K. I did do actually some work on Ingress on KVM recently. The, the main problem with Ingress, from my point of view, is um, the policying engine can only drop packets. Um, and that doesn't. Then I can easily create such scenarios where the CPU is spinning quite hard. Especially, for instance, if I'm doing Ingress filtering and the traffic's going to another VM. Um, Perhaps we should take it offline because it's actually quite a... <laughs> yeah, if you want, I can hook you up with one of the guys in the Red Hat ET lab who uh, can oh, that would be great. give you some really good stuff. But my personal opinion, my personal feeling of the KVM stuff right now, having worked on it for only a short time, is um, there's been a lot of focus on performance and correctness and not so much focus on making sure the QoS side of things works properly. Um, I would like to change that. I, I think you're going to see an awful lot of work in that area because it's the only way we can compete with VMware in the virtualization space. Yes, so I mean I have, when I go to my customers and they're mo mostly using Zen, this is, the QoS issue is very important to them. Um, but maybe, maybe we should move on to the interesting problems I found, um, which also all have fixes, so before you put your hands up and ask for the fix, it's always, I, I will get to that. Um, so I was using Red Hat 5.4, well, 5.4, I believe, something like that. Um, I think these problems are all relevant because I haven't filed them in the bug tracker yet, and I apologize for that. Um, 
So what's the problem here? Um, VLANs don't support scatter gather. They do now. They don't in the 2618 kernel, which is what Red Hat is based on. Um, what's Okay, so scattergather is basically the idea that I have a bunch of fragments that comprise a packet on SKB. Um, I don't have to join them all up into a contiguous memory segment before doing the transmit. Um, so if they come in as multiple packets, they pass through the whole multiple fragments. They can pass through the whole stack as multiple fragments, and the uh, network card will magically combine them at the very last minute. Um, it's a performance optimization. You want to use it regardless of the problem I'm trying to describe. Um, if you have a NIC that doesn't support SK scattergather, which is essentially no NICs, it just happens that VLAN was a corner case that hadn't been fixed yet, um, it will linearize them. So it basically makes a copy of the SKB and copies all the da data from the different fragments into one big fragment. Um, this completely destroys, destroys the flow control I described in that diagram, which had lots of arrows on it, um, which means that the ring buffer slots become freed a lot earlier than they should be, and so the CPU can basically will just get into a feedback loop of the guest sends something and the host drops it. Um, the results are quite profound. You, you essentially you lose any kind of interactivity to the host. Um, it's a problem. So the workaround, if you're worried about this, this will work on essentially any version of Zen on any uh, kernel, is to rate limit. The virtual NIC itself actually has a rate limiting facility, and this is how you activate it. Um, this still uses quite a bit of CPU because there's dropping going on, but uh, it just turns out that it drops them early enough that the DOS kind of scenario doesn't manifest. Uh, the solution to this problem is to enable scatter gather on VLAN, and that has been done um, in newer kernels at least. Um, but the problem would still manifest if you happen to find another interface, whether it be physical or virtual, um, that didn't support scatter gather. So there's a general problem there. Um, I kind of doubt that anyone's actually running into it other than the VLAN case. So here's some details of the patches that fix it up. They're actually quite short. Um, problem solved. OK, problem two. There are only three problems, so I'm, I'm getting towards the end anyway. Um, bonding. We observed a, a, a different problem when we were using bonding interfaces. Um, <coughs> Essentially, what we would try to do is set some classes up to use around about half a gigabit a second, and we'd be getting sort of about 10% of that. Not really what we wanted. Um, not as bad as the DOS problem, but it's still not real good. So some solutions to this problem, which are, well, sorry, I'll go back. So w why is this a problem? How, how does this problem, well, how has it happen? Uh, basically, what happens is, by default, the bonding interface, which is a virtual interface of sorts, um, has a queue length of zero, because the bonding interface is always going to be backed by some physical interface. It has its own queue. Why add another queue? OK, that's fine. Um, when you add a queue disk to um, any interface, it will default, its default queue length will be that of the interface it's been connected to. OK, so we end up with a queue disk of, with, a queue, with a queue length of zero. And essentially, the way that the HTB algorithm works, and I can't explain exactly why this is the case, but the way that it works is it actually needs a little bit of buffer. If, if it can only has one packet to, packet to play with, it can't actually do its job effectively. And that's the result that you're seeing at the bottom of this slide. Fortunately, this problem is trivial to fix. Um, I did actually ask the the bonding maintainer whether this behavior was intentional, and he said yes. So I didn't, there's no patches, but all you have to do is increase the queue lengths. Um, a thousand seems to be the magic number that everyone uses. I actually found that anything from about 16 was okay. Uh, so problem solved. Works all as expected. Okay, the third and last problem. Sorry. Oh, Herbert. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, back on that bonding issue, um, wouldn't another s possible solution be to actually apply your rating on the physical interfaces? 
rather than bonding the face itself. Could I apply the rate limiting on the physical interface rather than bonding interface? Probably, yes. And that, that might actually be more logical. Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, and in this case, the bond was, um, they were doing it for higher availability rather than aggregation, so that would work just fine, I expect. Okay, so maybe this was a uh, poor design problem. Okay, so the last one is, is a bug which has been fixed. Um, so TSO is a mechanism by which essentially SKBs that are much larger than, the packet SKBs that are much larger than MTU le lengths traverse the network stack until right at the last minute when they're diced up or segmented into MTU size bytes. And the reason is it's much easier to, it's much cheaper to process one very large packet than many small packets. Okay, that's fine. Unfortunately, there's a problem with this in relation to the way that HDB count, accounts for the cost of a packet. Um, and it's really geared towards the idea that basically everyone's using 1500 byte packets. Whereas in the TSO case, um, you, you can quite easily see 64,000, 65, yeah, 64 kilobyte packets coming in from the guest. So it's significantly larger than 1500 bytes. Um, and the result is essentially that you might be missed. You, you, it's basically the same as if you don't have any of this, this configuration I spoke of earlier set at all. Um, so it's a bit of a problem. So I'll try and explain very briefly uh, why this occurs. Um, essentially, we create, we, uh, <coughs> the code calculates this value called um, seal log, which is related to the uh, log two of the MTU, where the MTU for some reason I don't understand is 2047, which is a number close to 1500, but never mind, it doesn't matter. Um, it, that, that's actually unimportant to this problem. Um, the point is that this is quite a long way from uh, 64,000. Um, and the answer to this is three. I actually simplified this code. Um, th th this slide's not about the math. So it's about the fact that it's a log based on some number around 2,000. Um, and we get three. And then what do we do? We basically set up a table based on this. And this table is going to basically tell us, for, for each of a range of packet sizes, how much they cost, how much they should be charged. And the table looks a little bit like this. is little tiny packets like this um, get a value of 16. Oh, sorry. Get a value of 16, yeah. And packets up to about this size get a value around 2,000. And is this is the critical one. Any packet that's bigger than this gets a value of this. Okay, that's not so bad. But this means that a two, two kilobyte packet will be accounted as 2,000. But a 64 kilobyte packet will also be accounted as 2,000. So that's not good. Um, it's it's uh, being undercharged by quite a margin. Um, so. Uh, I, I should have mentioned earlier, I was not al allowed to modify the production kernel at all, so this is why there's these workarounds. Um, the workaround, number one, which doesn't really work, is to turn off uh, TSO in the guest. That's okay, except uh, I said earlier on my guests were uh, not necessarily very friendly, so they could just turn it back on again. Okay, it's a problem. <laughs> I guess, yeah, I guess I could have refused it somehow, but I'm not sure. Um, working on round number two is uh, much more effective. Um, we change that magic 2,000 value to uh, another magic number, which is 40,000. Um, we observe that 40,000 is also not 64,000, but it is much closer. And it turns out to that in terms of the way that table I showed earlier works, that that is... Uh, it's a good number. It's big enough to account. It's big enough that the really big packets get charged sufficiently highly and that we don't lose too much granularity at the lower end. And this basically works. Okay, so if you have this problem, 
Uh, this is what I would suggest doing. The solution to the problem, however, is uh, to, of course, fix the kernel. So all it does is basically says, OK, you're a 64,000 byte packet. OK, so that's like 32, 2,000 byte packets. So we'll just charge you 32 times the maximum rate plus any change that's left over at the end. And that works. That, and that basically worked. The algorithm now works as it was intended. So this is the end of my presentation today. Um, so what did I get out of this process? Um, existing infrastructure works quite well for doing bandwidth control. I expected to do a lot more development than I did. I mean, other than these bug fixes, I did none, I, which was disappointing because I'm a developer. But uh, <laughs> you know. Um, so the key you need to do is you need to be able to identify the packets. The example I gave was extremely simple, where we're just trying to basically break it down on a per guest basis. You may quite easily want to do something more complicated. In fact, in the scenario that this is going into, the host was actually using iSCSI. Um, and so we wanted to ensure that it got a fair amount of bandwidth. And so it had its own class. The fact that HTB is hierarchical made that possible. Um, yes, so you need to identify what the problem is um, and design an appropriate class hierarchy. And perhaps the most important thing is there are subtle traps. This uh, TC in particular, but in general, networking, Linux networking is very complicated. There are many, many knobs. You may think that you've turned the ones to do what you want to do. Um, you need to test. I'm pretty sure that there are holes in the rules that I wrote above, but they pass the tests for the traffic that we were interested in. And I, I'm not sure there's much more you can do than that. Um, so thank you, everybody, for your time. And I think we have time for more questions. So um, is, is there actually anything uh, specific to a virtualized environment here? I mean, it seems to me that you'd have exactly the same problem with a bunch of real physically different hosts behind a, a switch, right. as long as the, the things on one side of the switch have a greater aggregate bandwidth than, the, than what's on the outside, which would almost always be the case, I would think. Yes, um, so this is a... Many of these problems are generic at many levels. Um, so yes, if you were looked at a physical network, you would see similar problems. Um, even actually, if you looked at processes from forget virtualization, you can create similar scenarios. Um, so it's a, it's a very specific work look at a very general problem. Right, well, Simon, thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you.